sight, yeah Greatness in your sight, yeah I came from the bottom for real. Be rose from the bottom for real. I came from the uh, be rose from the bottom for real. I caught it, kinda that sound I got it. Yeah. Who'd have thought it? Got it done use the sonics. Right on time. Got it done elevating me. I had a climb. We ain't come up the easy way. I need a climb. Got all this pressure put on me, but it made diamonds. Deep in the shy, that it won't bite, yeah. Now it's time. God done took me off the shelf. If I change, I'll be to reflection of his wealth, what the price? Yeah, he bought me, I'm so free, thanks to his help. Took some time, who'd have thought that I'd succeed being myself? Whoa. Got a light, I'ma shine, this is start, not my prime, hey Ooh, 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 ooh Lord, what you want, I'ma do Yeah, I'm part of your crew Really nothing you can do With you, I can never lose Ooh, ooh, anybody you can use, yeah I came from the bottom for real We rose from the bottom for real I came from the, we rose from the bottom for real Iconic, kinda that sound ironic, yeah if they want an issue, it is what it is, it's always been that 50 round drum when I'm praying, I'm ready for any attack A lot of my mind, a lot of my chest, but I'm holding it back Fuels my blood, we closer to slime and closer to slack Yeah, and I'm on they side, what's wrong with these people? I'm keeping my spot, I was born with the cheetahs The planet of apes, I run with Lucy Let's free all my brothers, I know they some keepers Don't let my grandmother, I know she with Jesus Rush out with Chris Tucker, I'm fighting the evil I keep it 1,000, ain't trying to mislead you I put some new gold on the princess of Egypt Yeah, you put on the front, but you never rode in the wet And I'm on chariots, I'm trying to make back the trolls I'm a barbarian, I can't be quiet for nothing And I'm still shining, I can surprise the sun if they want an issue, it is what it is, it's always been that 50 round drum when I'm praying, I'm ready for any attack A lot of my mind, a lot of my chest, but I'm holding it back It fuels my blood, we closer than slime and closer than slack Look, I ran with them demons and played with the dragon Came with the sticks like I'm playing on Madden Scam with the visa, you know I was having A new money counter went beep like the seatbelt of Vessin My truck get flipped over, I should have been dead But I know I'm alive for a reason God gave me so many chances, I probably look dumbass and chance for a feature Every 12 months is my season, yeah Tell me I'll still be with Jesus, yeah There ain't no way I can lose, but you touch on my kids and I take you to meet them My strength is admitting my weakness, I'm crazy, you off on the weekends You Jonah, I'm catching you sleeping, you off on my shit, pray to God they don't eat them If they want an issue, it is what it is, it's always been that 50 round drum when I'm praying, I'm ready for any attack A lot of my mind, a lot of my chest, but I'm holding it back It fuels my blood, we closer than slime and closer than slack According to multiple sources, the word rooted can be defined as securely fixed, firmly grounded, or fully established. Yeah. This is the point where I usually throw out some random fact or shout out every minute, every day, you know the rest. But I'm not going to do it this time. Planet in the world that I cannot move And it has me so built up So strong that I cannot lose My life is so much more than likes Views, follow streams Cause I get this nourishment From waters of the living streams it's Yeah. 
fake built up and so Hi. Disputed. Welcome back. Yeah, I saw a lot of you in the hey. morning. Love. It's good. Joy. Yeah. Hold this the right way. It's good that you're back. Truth. And I am so excited because we have two of my favorite speakers in the world this afternoon. But I'm going to pray to get started. Everybody bow your heads. Thank you, Lord, for this amazing time. I thank you, Father, for all of these students. I thank you, Father, for what you did this morning. And I thank you, Lord, that they have ears to hear, that they'll hear every word that is preached this afternoon, and that all of it gets rooted and planted in their hearts and lived out in their lives. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Praise God. I have one announcement before we get uh, started. Has anybody lost anything? Wow, that's weird. Nobody's lost anything, but yet we have items at Lost and Found. So if you have lost something, we have found it. If you uh, need to find something that you've lost, you can go to registration and it will be there. But like I said, we had some amazing speakers that are going to preach this afternoon. And first off, I'm so excited that I get to introduce this one. First off, we have someone who serves with the heart of compassion, who prays like nobody that I know, and his name is Pastor Holden. Everybody give it up for Pastor Holden. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Dan. For those of you who don't understand how heavy this pulpit is, this pulpit is extremely heavy. And Dan just handles it like it's a mint. Amen. How are you guys doing today? Right. Welcome to Southwest. Oh, that was pretty weak. That was pretty weak. We're going to have a good week. Amen. Amen. Uh, turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. And I am excited. There's, mess there's just certain messages that when the Lord gives them to you or whenever you hear them, a lot of what I'm going to teach on today, I actually heard from heard uh, and it just it shocked me and I was young in my faith whenever I first heard it and it was some things that I heard in this message that really turned me on fire and really helped me become uh, able to trust the word and everything that it says okay uh, if you wanted to, to, to a theme for the this week is established and in established we're talking about being established in faith established in righteousness, established in our identity. And today what we're going to camp out on is being, or this session rather, we're going to camp out on being established in the word. Amen. Amen. We're going to camp out on being established in the word. I've actually preached this message before in, uh, out of Southwest. It was two or three years ago, but new people are here. Um, and, uh, and it's been a couple years. So I'm going to, the Lord led me and I don't, I'd never re-preach a message unless the Lord very, very clearly points out and makes it very plain and obvious that that's exactly what he wants us to do. And as I was praying about it, it just seemed right that this is what we do. So we're going to jump right in Ephesians chapter one, and I'm going to start in verse 16. Um, and I'm going to be reading a lot out of the Amplified Classic translation, but we'll also read a little bit out of the King James. So we're going to start in the uh, cl classic translation it says this for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is God's power working unto salvation so I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ there's nothing to be ashamed about in the gospel okay there's nothing to be ashamed about in the gospel in fact it's the gospel that saves you it's the gospel that heals you it's the gospel that delivers you it's the gospel that blesses you it's the gospel that protects you it's the gospel that 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 empowers you it's the gospel that calls you there's nothing for you to be ashamed about in the gospel in fact we are to be lighthouses we are to be a light we're to be examples and we're supposed to be carriers of the gospel so that way whenever we go to our school we're not shying away from what the gospel says but we say no I believe this gospel full and wholeheartedly I'm not backing away from the gospel because it's this gospel of my Lord and Savior Jesus is the reason why I am that I am okay there's nothing to be ashamed about in the gospel well, it goes on and says, it's the power of God unto salvation. So in the gospel contains the power of God. There is no power outside of the gospel. 
Okay? There is no power outside of the gospel. It says this, uh, for everyone who believes, okay, so that's an indication. So if this power in the gospel is going to work in my life, I'm going to have to believe in the gospel. The power doesn't work in your life without you believing. So if you don't have faith in the gospel, then it doesn't matter what this book says. It won't happen in your life. And then you'll ask all the days, all your life, why isn't this happening? Why isn't it happening? Well, the answer is really simple. It's because you don't really, truly believe it. But if you ever get to a point where you really, truly believe what the gospel says, then you'll enter, in, enter into a phase where what the gospel says will actually happen in your life. There's another verse that says the word works effectually in them who believe. In other words, if you believe, then the word will work. If you don't believe, then the word won't work. There is no gray area. There is no maybe it'll work, maybe it won't work. It is no. If you believe, then the word will work. If you do not believe, the word will not work. And the amazing thing is, is God has given you the option, the ability and the empowerment to choose which way you stand. Amen. You can either choose to believe or you can choose to not believe. That choice is nobody else but yours. The choice is nobody else but yours. Verse 17. For in the gospel is a righteousness which God ascribes is revealed, both springing from faith and leading to faith, as it is written, the man who through faith is just and upright shall live and shall live by faith. For God's holy wrath and indignation are revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who in their wickedness repress and hinder the truth and make it inoperative. For that which is known about God is evident to them and made plain in their inner conscience because God himself has shown it to them. This verse has always baffled me because it says not only God, God has made himself known to both the believer and the unbeliever. God has made himself known to both the unbeliever and the believer. Verse 20 says what he means. For ever since the creation of the world, his invisible nature and attributes, that is his eternal power and divinity, have been made intelligible and clearly discernible in and through things that have been made so that men are without excuse. Okay. So what is he saying right there? There's a lot of words. Let's sum it up. You, nobody in the world is, has an excuse to say that God doesn't exist and that the word is not true. The mountains testify that there's a God. The trees testify that there's a God. Uh, the humans testify that there's a God. All of creation points to one reality and one reality alone, and it's not the Big Bang Theory. It's God, that there is a God, that there's only one God, and that there's only one God who was able to do all of these different things and create all the, the stars point to God, the planets point to God. The fact that the universe is still expanding at this very second, while I'm speaking, the universe just expanded like 200,000 miles. It's amazing. And that doesn't just happen. That's a product of something bigger than itself. And that something bigger than itself is its creator, who's God. And the Bible said just now that men are without excuse. There is a creator. And we have to be established that we have been created in the image of our creator. Okay. Let's rabbit show here for a second. You are not created in the image of an angel. If you were created in the image of an angel, according to what the Bible says, you might look like a wheel. You might have six arms or six wings. You might have eyes all over your head. Listen, you want to know why people were afraid nine times out of 10, whenever they say all angels, because they're freaky looking creatures, guys. They're freaky looking creatures. But the reality of it is, is you were not made in the image of an angel. You were made in the image of God. You want to know what God looks like? Go look in the mirror. He's got two eyes. He's got a nose. He's got a mouth. He's got a hand with five fingers. He's got two legs. 
He's got a chest and a torso. He looks like you. One of my favorite things I've ever heard Brother Jesse said is this. The heart of God is the Father. The face of God is the Lord Jesus. The voice of God is the Holy Spirit, but the hands of God is the church. That's you. You are to be a reflection of God in the earth and be established in your identity in him and not in your identity in your struggles, not in your identity in your failures, not in your identity of your sin, not in your identity of anything else except God and what he says about you. Amen? Amen. All right. Y'all ready? To, we're going to build on this. There are in number, in number, okay, there are four major religions in the world, okay? Four major religions in the world. Number one is Christianity with 2.6 billion. Number, yeah, amen. We know we're not a religion, we're a relationship, but I'm giving you numbers. These are numbers. Number two is Islam with 1.9 billion. Number three is Hinduism with 1.2 billion. And number four is Buddhism with 5.35 million, okay? Now, each one of these have similar practices, right? They have practices. They do things that they do. Each one has a service that they gather together and go to. Each one has some sort of a type of prayer that they do uh, in some way, shape, or form. Now, we know that anything outside of praying to God in the name of Jesus is not prayer at all. We know this, but I'm just talking about common practices. Each one has some kind of an end time theology, right? But there's two main questions in this, in all of these that each religion asks that is the defining line between truth and a religion. Christianity is truth. Judaism is truth. But all the other stuff, that is a religion. And there's two questions that is the dividing line. First question is who is Jesus? Second question is who's got the right book? Who is Jesus and who's got the right book? And today we're going to go through a journey and we are going to look at the infallibility of the word of God. Now the infallibility, it's a big word, means that the word of God does not have error. The word of God does not have contradiction. The word of God is totally and completely perfect. And you can rest in the assurance and in the reality of the word of God. Y'all ready? All right. So Colossians chapter two, verses six through seven says this, as you, this is our theme verse, as you have, therefore, this is the Amplified Classic translation. I'm going to read the verse now. Praise the Lord. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus, the Lord, walk in union with him and conformity to him, having your roots being continually built up in him, becoming increasingly and more conform, confirmed and established in faith. Now we are established according to this verse in Christ. Okay. We are established in Christ. Now the Bible says that the word became flesh. Jesus is the word. You cannot be established in Christ without being established in the word. Whenever you open up your Bible and you read it, that is Jesus speaking directly to you. That's Jesus speaking directly to you. It says that we're established in faith. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. In other words, you, there is no uh, being established in faith if you don't believe and trust in the word. You have to trust in the word to be established in all of these things. Now, in uh, 1908, there was a man who this is, we're going to build on this in levels. I just find this interesting. God will not be mocked. Okay. God will not be mocked. And in 1908, a man died by the name of Chester Bissell. Okay. Or Bikel, one of the two. I don't know how to say his last name. B-E-C-E-L-L. -L. Now this man knew the Bible forwards and backwards. Okay, this man knew Genesis through Revelation. And in fact, he would oftentimes uh, invite people, invite preachers to his house to argue with them and try to point out the inaccuracy of the word. 
Okay. Now this man knew a lot about the Bible, but he didn't allow the Bible to open up the door to that relationship with Jesus. There's a lot of people out there in the world that know a lot about the Bible, but they have no idea who Jesus is. And that is a sad reality. And this man was one of those people. He knew about the Bible. He knew about the God of the Bible, but he didn't really know the God of the Bible. And whenever he, he said, if there's any, let me just read you his exact quote. His exact quote was, if there be a God or any truth in the Bible, let my body be infested with snakes. Gross, right? But this man was that blasphemous, okay? Put that image, the first image on the board, Jess. This is a picture of it. And this is from an article during those days. Now, what I want you to point out is, uh, is you can't see it because of the musical instruments, but I'm going to read you the last phrase. It says, if there's a God, my grave will be infested with snakes. And then whenever it came down to it and they were digging his grave after, his, after he died, the man who dug the grave said at the funeral, it was necessary to remove a snake from the grave before the casket could be lowered. I say again, God will not be mocked. But this man knew the Bible. He knew the Bible. You can take that picture down. Let's talk about the Bible. The Bible is made up of two different covenants. The first covenant is the old covenant, which is Genesis through Malachi. Genesis through Malachi. The second covenant is the new covenant, which is Matthew through Revelation. Okay. And for those of you, this could be a little fun fact. Whenever we say Old Testament and New Testament, we're talking about the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. It is two covenants, not, not three, nothing else. It is two covenants written and compiled together in one book. Now, the Bible was made up of several different authors scanning thousands of years. Okay, The first author of the Bible was Moses. What five books did Moses write? Can anybody tell me? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Can anybody tell me what that is called? The Torah, the Pentateuch. That's impressive. You guys are awesome. So Moses was the first author. The second officer, officer the last author, was the Apostle John in 90 A.D., so from 1312 B.C., in other words, 1,312 years before Christ to 90 years after Christ, the 66 books of the Bible were written by numerous authors in between. That's just the first and the last. OK, now the Bible was written in two different languages. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. the New Testament was written in. Good job. Now, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says this. Every scripture is God-breathed. King James says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. In other words, this book is not a compilation of man's ideas. This book was written as, 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 as men were inspired by God to write words on a page. Paul may have written it, but Paul is not the author. Moses may have written it, but Moses is not the author. God is the author of every single word in this book. I know this is like Sunday School 101, but we're building on something. Okay? Proverbs chapter 25 verse 2 says, It's the glory of God to conceal a thing, but it's the glory of a king to search it out. Today we're going to search out some things. Because the reality of it is, is it's hard to argue with chapter and verse whenever you're talking to somebody who doesn't believe the chapter and verse that you have. Okay? Anybody have a, an argument, be in an argument with somebody and say, Well, Matthew 16 verse 2 says da 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 It doesn't matter to them because they don't believe Matthew chapter 16 verse 2. Today we're going to walk through some concrete facts of the reality of the, of the, of the, of the accuracy of the Word of God. Are y'all ready? All that was my intro. That was a 20 minute intro. Congratulations. <laughs> now we're really getting going. Have you ever wondered why God puts genealogies in the Bible? Raise your hand if you've skipped over the genealogies. I actually find it quite fascinating. <laughs> I have skipped over the genealogies more time than you can count. Okay. But there's purpose in genealogies. 
Okay? God doesn't just put it in there for no reason at all. There's nothing in the Bible that is without reason. Okay? God puts the genealogies in the Bible for a reason. Now, one of the reasons I'm convinced is this. In Genesis chapter 5, the Bible lists out the first 10 people born or created, being Adam, born in the Bible. Adam was created, and the significant thing about the Bible and about names in the Bible is each name carries with it a meaning. Does anybody know what your name means? What does your name mean? Huh? Peace. Okay. The Father's Joy. That's awesome. Anybody else? What's your name mean? Yahweh exalts right there, end of the row. Rhythmic. Rhythmic? That's awesome. Cool, cool. So all that to say that your name has a meaning. Judy, Jews were, are very, 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 very aware of what their name means. Okay? Very aware of what their name means. My name, Holden, means to hold on, believe it or not. I know, real special. <laughs> My middle name, Aaron, means to teach. Guess what I'm up here doing? Shocker, right? Coincidence? I think not. But what's the point? Your name has a meaning, okay? So listen to this. These are the first 10 people born in the, born in the Bible. Adam, what does Adam mean? Man, somebody said it over there. Adam means man, okay? And then because of everything with Cain and Abel, you actually start with Adam's, I guess, round two, which is Seth, okay? Seth means appointed, you with me? So Adam means man. Seth means appointed. Enosh, not Enoch, Enosh with an S-H, means mortal. Kenan means sorrow. Mahalalel means the blessed God. Jared, how does that make sense? You got Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalalel, and Jared. And then after Jared is Enoch. Are you kidding me? Jared means shall come down. Enoch means teaching. Methuselah means his death shall bring. Lamech means, I'm trying to get that Hebrew in there too. It's just difficult. <laughs> Lamech means despairing. Noah means comfort. Okay, so put that graphic on the screen. Adam, man, Seth, the pointed, Enosh, mortal, Kenan, sorrow, Mahalalel, the blessed God, Jared, shall come down, Enoch, teaching, Methuselah, his death shall bring, Lamech, despairing, Noah, rest. You can verify all this. If you were to take the first ten names of the Bible and make it a sentence, it would be, man is appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down teaching, and his death shall bring the despairing rest. Hang on, hang on, hang on. This was written 1,300 years before Jesus even came. Before Moses even had an idea of what Jesus, of who Jesus was. He knew a man was coming. But the first 10 names of the Bible spell out the gospel all the way back in Genesis chapter 5. Coincidence? I think, I think not. All right, let's go a little bit deeper. Um, again, everything I'm about to say in Genesis chapter 5 and 11. And y'all be believing with me. Use, use your faith for me, for me, please. Because we're about to get into some numbers, okay? Y'all okay with some numbers? Yeah. Somebody said no. It's not algebra. It's not algebra. We'll be good to go. It is a lot of addition, though. Put that graphic on the screen, the really th thin one, and you can leave that up there. All right, so this was how old each person was when they had their child. Okay, you with me? So Adam was 130 when he had Seth. Seth was 105 when he had Enosh. So to walk this through... 235 years after Adam was created, Enosh was born, okay? 
and then you add 70 to that, and then uh, I wrote the number down for my sake. And then uh, 325 years after 235, then 325 years after Adam was created, Kenan was born. Okay, so these were the numbers behind each one being born. Uh, the reason why you see 500 and 502 at Noah is because uh, some Jewish traditions don't include the flood years. For, so we're go, but it's actually 502. Okay. I don't know, it was 502 years old whenever he had Shem, okay? Praise the Lord for 502. Um, so you walk through all of these things and you get all the way to Abraham down at the bottom. All the way down to Abraham. And if you add it up all the way from Adam to Abraham... Abraham was born 1,948 years after Adam was created. Okay? Say that with me. 1,948 years after Adam was created. You with me? Now, with Abraham, there was a certain nation established. What was that nation called? Israel. Israel. You're exactly right. Okay, now, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45 calls Jesus what? Can anybody tell me? Emmanuel? The second Adam. Calls Jesus the second Adam. I told you we're getting to some numbers here, but bear with me. We're going somewhere. The second Adam was born. Now, when Jesus was born in our calendar, it reset the clock, which is why we have B.C. and we have A.D. So from Adam to Abraham was 1,900, 1,948 years. From the second Adam, 1,948 years later, the nation of Israel was reestablished. On May 14th, 1948, the nation of Israel was reestablished. Now, what does that mean? That means that it took 1,948 years for Abraham to be born, which started Israel. And then when Jesus, the second Adam, came, it was 1,948 years where Israel was reestablished. Y'all with me? Okay. Now, the Bible was not written in chapter and verse. Okay. The Bible was not written in chapter and verse. The Bible was written in the form of a letter or the Bible was written in the form of a poem or a song or something like that. But it is not written in chapter and verse. Chapter and verse was added later to divide thoughts. OK, it was added later to divide thoughts. But even in those division of thoughts, the hand of God was involved. And I'll show you why. Um, you can look at this, and if you were to look at the number of verses in the book of Genesis, you would find 1,533 verses in the book of Genesis. 1,533 verses in the book of Genesis. Now, Exodus has 1,213 verses. Leviticus has 859 verses. Numbers has 1,288 verses. Deuteronomy has 959 verses. Meaning that the first five books of the Bible total in total have 5,852 verses. Okay? So 5,852 verses. Those number of verses have prophecy laced within them. Those number of verses have prophecy laced within them. These are the things that the Jews, Jewish people, they search these things out. They study these things. We've forgotten about it. We don't even think about it. But if we come back to our roots, we'll start and we have a tenacity to search out the Bible like they do. We'll begin to find some of these things. So in, uh, I, we'll just use this as an example. Verse number 5,708 in the Bible takes you to Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 5. Okay, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 5. Now, year 5,708 in the Jewish calendar, the Jewish calendar, remember, they don't quite yet believe in the Messiah, so their calendar never re reset. They're still, they're at 5,000 and something. I don't know off the top of my head, excuse me. But the, the, the Jewish year, 
5,708 is the same year in our calendar as 1948. What did we just establish happened in 1948? Israel became a nation again. Listen to what Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 5 says. And the Lord your God will bring you into the land which your fathers possessed. Prophecy is laced even in the number of the verse that you find. And it happens like this all throughout the Bible. All throughout the Bible. Are y'all still with me? Can y'all hand me a few more numbers? Can y'all hand me a few num more numbers? Can y'all handle a few more numbers? Some of y'all are coughing. Some of y'all are saying yes. Some of y'all are just blatantly saying no. But you guys can handle a few more numbers. Okay, everybody say the word gematria. Gematria is a fun word. And uh, gematria is actually where we get our word geometry from. Gematria, geometry, you can kind of hear the same. Gematria is very, very known in Jewish tradition, okay? Again, here in Western society, we don't think nothing about it because we're shallow. I love us, but we are. We're shallow in a lot of ways. But Jews find every possible way to study the Bible, okay? Now, uh, let me explain something about the Hebrew alphabet and the Greek alphabet. You can put that Hebrew alphabet graphic up there. In Hebrew, each alphabet letter has a number assigned to it, okay? And in fact, in early Hebrew, oftentimes they didn't even count by numbers. They actually counted by the letters in the alphabet, okay? So Aleph is one, Bet is two, Gimel is three, Dalit is four, He is five, Semek is 60, uh, Nun is 70, so on and so forth, okay? So each alphabet letter has a number attached to it. And this is a Hebrew example, but the same works with the Greek. The Greek is the same way. An alphabet number, ha an alphabet letter has a number attached to it. Okay? You ready? In the Bible, specifically in the New Testament, there's a lot of names for Jesus. Messiah, uh, the blessed one, healer, savior, all that. But the name for Jesus that is used most often is Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Lord Jesus Christ. Three words. Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in Gematria, this is, this is fascinating to me. Are you ready? Okay. In Gematria, Lord has the number value of 800. Jesus has the number value of 888. Christ has the number value of 1,480. I wish it was 1,440, but it's not. They, he overshot it by 40 points. I'm kidding. 1,480, totaling 3,168. Okay, let me go ahead and say something, pause right here. Numbers are important to God. He wrote a whole book about them. <laughs> ha ha. Numbers are important to God. Um, do you think it's a coincidence that Jesus had 12 disciples and that there were 12 tribes of Israel? Do you think that's a coincidence? No. And you see that time and time and time and time again. Numbers are very, very, very important to God. So whenever we see the Lord Jesus Christ equaling in numeric value 3,168, you would be shocked at how much that number is laced throughout all of existence. All of existence has that number in it. Almost all of existence. 3,168. Uh, you can look at the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay, This is where the Bible starts. The 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, Asher has 501. Benjamin is equivalent to 152. Dan is equivalent to 55. Gad is equivalent to 8. Poor Gad. He, he, he's the lowest. Issachar, 830, so on and so forth. If you were to take the names of the 12 tribes of Israel and add them up, it would be 3,168. It's amazing. Now, this is fascinating to me. 
Uh, in the human body right now, we're still with that number, 3,168. Well, let me talk about the brain real quick, actually. The average brain weighs 3.168 pounds. Why? Because God wants you to know that you have the mind of Christ. Now, the blood. In your body right now, you have 60,000 miles worth of blood veins. I know, shocker. That's amazing in and of itself. You have 60,000 miles worth of blood in your body right now. If you were to take all your blood vessels and stretch them out, it would wrap the earth like five times in your body right now. Just ponder that for a second and think about how marvelous God is. 60,000 miles. Now, if you were to take 60,000 miles and convert that to feet, you would have 316,800,000. In Gematria, you drop the zeros because they have no value. What number is left? 3,168. Again, that number is laced throughout all the Bible. In the blood, in the blood, you have a protein. And this protein is called, I'm going to botch it, I botch it every time, lamininin. I don't know. Lumen, lumininin, lamininin, lamin, lamin, lumen, lemin, lamin, lamininin, lamininin. So that wasn't even fair. Lamininin. We're just going to go with it. Lamininin. This, this is actually a protein. Okay? And this is found in your blood. This is the core of your blood. Um, this is at the very core of your blood cells. Okay? And the amazing thing is, is about this, this particular protein that starts with an L, and it's a name that I have no idea how to pronounce, acts as a biological glue that holds all your tissues and organs together. Without this protein, your body would literally fall apart. Okay? Without this protein, your body would literally fall apart. You want to know what this protein looks like? That is in the center of your blood and without it, your body would fall apart. God is wanting you to know that according to Colossians chapter 117, he exists before anything else and he holds all creation together. With a protein that is shaped like a cross in your blood and it was on a cross where Jesus spilt all of his blood. It's amazing to me. It's amazing to me. Okay, let's talk about creation. Genesis chapter two, verse nine. Scripture says this, and out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then in go on on later, I believe it was verse 10. It says, likewise, God formed man out of the dust of the ground. This is one of the most amazing things to me. It's amazing how many times God indicates in creation what part of the body that particular food is good for. All of this, you can Google it, you can search it. These aren't just similarities. This, it's proven fact. God created everything and he assigned everything with a purpose. And you can tell by the food. Put that first food up there. Can anybody know, does anybody know what that is? A walnut. It is a proven fact that walnuts are good for your brain and it just so happens that a walnut looks like a brain. Go back to the walnut. Literally, you have it divided in two different halves. You have all the grooves and then you have all the gross looking veins and all of that stuff and it is beneficial for your brain, and it just so happens to look like a brain. Coincidence? I think not. Go to the next one. 
A carrot. If you take a carrot and you cut it down the middle, right in half, that's what it looks like. And how many of your parents told you, eat your carrots so you can have good? And it just so happens to look like an eyeball. Go back to the carrot. Look at this. You got, I wish I had a laser. I need a laser or like a tick, 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 stick. You got the retina. Wow, it's really hard to look at stuff that close to this big of a screen. Okay, hang on. You got the retina. And then you got the color. And then you got the white of the eye. The inside of a carrot is known. Oh, praise the Lord. It might not show up on the screen. How do I use it? Ah, projector. Can y'all put it on the projector? Do y'all have access to do that? Ah, there we go. All right. So <laughs> go back, go back to the eye. Pupil, go back to the carrot. Pupil, go back to the eye. Retina, go back to the carrot. Retina, go back to the eye. Whites, go back to the carrot. Whites. A carrot just so happens to look like an eye and it's beneficial for your eye. Coincidence? I think not. Go to the next one. A hot tomato. A tomato. Go to the next one. Not, not the next fruit. A heart. It is a proven fact that tomatoes are good for your heart. Go back to the tomato. You got one chamber. Then you got two chambers. Go back to the heart. And then you got two sides of the heart. And it just so looks like if you were to cut a heart in half and cut a tomato in half, they're almost identical. They're almost identical. Coincidence? I'm going to keep you guys engaged the rest of the week. All right, go to the next one. Grapes. Can anybody take a guess? You can edit that out. Just go to the body part that it's good for. Go to the next picture. A heart. <clears throat> Let's move on from the grapes. Go to the next one. Kidney beans. Kidney beans. So that's what a kidney bean looks like. We didn't just name it kidney beans because it's what they look like. They look like kidney beans because they are good for your? Go to the next picture. Your kidney. Did anybody know that's what a kidney looked like? There was a lot more yeses than I thought, actually. That's impressive. I won't leave you guys out. I'll go to this screen. All right, go to the next picture. Avocados. Y'all ever see the reel of the baby who gets an avocado for Christmas? And like, oh, an avocado, thanks. <laughs> Avocados. Are y'all teenagers or not? It looks like a womb. Seriously, guys. Go back to the avocado. You have a womb, and then you have a pit inside of the womb, and then you have a woman's womb where a baby is on the inside of it. Okay, that's a pretty avocado. There we go. And then it's good for, and it's a proven fact that avocados are good for healthy wombs. And you can see this time and time and time again throughout the Bible. So what's my point in all this? It's not just so y'all can have fuel for an argument. It's for you guys. It's for you guys. 
everything from the first 10 names spelling out the gospel to Israel's history being laced throughout the Bible through your, your, the food that God created having literal assignments for your body parts. All of it is to help build your faith and strengthen you that the word of God is true, that the word of God is real, and that no matter what tries to come against you, the word of God stands forever. And you can, as Brother Copeland says, one word from God can change your life forever. You can take a word from God and you can stand on it and you can walk it all the way out to victory. And with that being said, I wanted to really start off because you're going to hear a lot of word this week. You're going to hear a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of word this week. And I wanted to preach this. I like teaching this. I didn't do it last year. I think I did it the year before, but a lot of new people here. I like teaching this at the front of the week so that way the rest of the week it helps build and renews your mind to the fact that the word of God is real. If you're going to receive anything from God, it's going to be because you believed this book. And this book is not an accident. This book is not full of coincidences. This book is real and this book will change your life forever. Amen. Amen. I want to pray before we transition into our next speaker. But Father, in the name of Jesus, go ahead and stand up. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you. I love you. I honor you. I give you praise and glory and I thank you for the reality of your word. I thank you that the word of God is true. I thank you that the word of God stands forever. I thank you that we can trust the word. I thank you that we can put our whole life on the word. I thank you that we can lift, we can, we can bank it that the word of God is true. Let God be true and every man be a liar. And we give you praise and we give you glory. And I thank you that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And I thank you that this is a 1440 that believes and trusts your word in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. Stretch something out. Shake off whatever needs to be shaken off. Do what you got to do. And without further ado. The man of the second hour. Give it up for Pastor John Jester. Great job, man. Great job. Praise God. Do you need Praise a pointer? No, I don't need a pointer. There's no pointer. a lot of power in pointers. There is a lot of power in a pointer, but I'm going to let you have all the power. All right. All the power in the pointer. Lift your hands toward heaven. Say this after me right now. Oh, that was like five of you. Say this after me right now. now, I open myself myself to hear hear the word of God. God. I believe that the word of God is true. true. So I take authority authority over my mind. My My mind is my mind. mind mind. Today, Today, I will think with the mind of Christ. I will will learn something new from the word of God. I I refuse to be tired. I refuse to be bored. I refuse to be be distracted. I I take this serious. This This is a matter of life and death. And And I choose life. life. Therefore, I choose the word. I I am a hearer hearer and a doer doer of the word of God God. in Jesus name. name. Amen. Amen. All right. You can have a seat. Glory to God. Um, So I'm going to do the altar call before I do the message. Um, A lot of times we think altar calls are times when we uh, just come up front and we get prayed for. An altar is a place where something goes to die. I was like, man, you just going out the gate like that? Just that's kind of rough. It's true. Um, In the Old Testament, when people would set up altars, to go and worship. Whenever you see in your Bible, he built an altar and he went to go worship. He actually built an altar and went to go make a sacrifice. And that was worship. 
So something died so that worship could take place. Um, And so I want us to build an altar at the beginning of this. And what's going to go and die is your distraction. Is boredom. Is I got to go use the bathroom. I need to go walk. I'm not telling you you can't go use the bathroom. Some of y'all looked at me real concerned <laughs> right then. I'm not telling you you can't, you can't go use the bathroom. What I am telling you is uh, if this was, if you, how many people are Marvel fans? I've looked at some of those Marvel movies. I've not ever, I've, I don't know that I've ever watched, uh, well, I've watched a few. I don't know that I've watched a lot of them uh, in, in the whole thing. Um, but some of them are like uh, two and a half hours long. And y'all sit at the theater for two and a half hours and don't move. Don't nobody go use a bathroom. Don't nobody go do nothing. Like you don't even go and refill your drink or get extra popcorn. You are watching the Marvel movie. You sit and play video games for hours on end. No bathroom break, no water break, no nothing. For some reason, I don't know what the reason is, but for some reason, when we start preaching, your bladder goes, excuse me, Uh, we need to have a conversation. Uh, I got things to say. Um, And an altar is a place where something goes to be sacrificed. That tells me that in order for you to worship, your reasonable, true and reasonable worship is to take authority over your body is what the word says and offer your body as a living sacrifice. That does not just mean don't go and sleep around and don't uh, use your body and defile your body. What it does mean is you get to tell your body what to do. Your body does not get to tell you what to do. So. Reasonable worship, a reasonable sacrifice is if you got to go to the bathroom and it just you got to go, you got to go. Right. But ask yourself this. If I were watching my favorite movie or playing my favorite video game or listening to my favorite music or at a Taylor Swift concert, would I move? Would I move? Because if, if your answer, and I'm, I'm going to trust you to say whether or not you're saying the right thing. And this is for the rest of the week, right? Uh, this is just us uh, teaching, all right? This is, that's what these afternoons are for, is teaching. This is for the rest of the week. If your answer is, there's no way I would move if I was at a Taylor Swift concert, then why are you moving when the word of God being preached? There's no way I would move if I was in a tournament playing my favorite video game with all my friends online. Well, why are you moving when the word of God's being preached? I paid for this movie. I'm not missing any of it. Then why are you moving when the word of God is preached? All right. The altar call before the sermon is I want you to grab a notebook and a pen and your Bible and let's get into the word. Because no matter how much you have an encounter, and I'm going to say something, and y'all going to be mad at me for saying it, but it's the truth. No matter how much you have an encounter with the living God here, if it doesn't get, if it's not established in your heart through the word of God, you will go home and totally forget it. Because we, and we say this at the end of convention, we say the band's not going home with you. The youth pastors aren't going home with you. All the people aren't going home with you. What are you going to do uh, to, to, to live this out and to, to, to continue this move of God? Well, I'm saying it on Monday afternoon. What are you going to do at the end of this convention when everything is all said and done to continue the move of God that he starts now? Because God can start moving in you. But if you don't allow him to move in you continually, that fire will burn out and you will be stuck back where you were. It's only the sustained word of God in your heart, the established word of God in your heart that will affect change in your life. Everything else is fandom. So you can cheer on the word of God. Good preaching, pastor. Good preaching. I'm preaching better than you. Amen. But that's okay. I got a black church on the inside of me. 
And down deep on the inside of me, there's a motherboard. Y'all don't even know what a motherboard is, but there's a motherboard. There's a, a whole a whole group of old ladies with big hats on. And they they amen me every time I think I did something right. They got white gloves on and they fan me and amen me and they rock back and forth and they say, yeah, Lord, I don't need you. I don't need you. I got it on the inside. OK. You can be a fan of God's word, but not a doer of his word. You can be you, you can you can enjoy praise and worship and enjoy jumping and, and shouting and fall out in the floor every time somebody touches your forehead. But if you don't do what the word says, you will respond to every altar call in a jacked up state, just like you responded to the first one. God's intention is not that you go from altar call to altar call is from glory to glory. Amen. Amen. All right, that ain't even what I'm going to preach. Colossians chapter, guess, One. two. It's on the back of my shirt. Colossians chapter two. Colossians chapter two, starting at verse six. We're going to read verse six and seven says, as you therefore have received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him, rooted in him. Everybody say rooted. rooted. Say rooted. rooted. Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith. Say established in the faith. So you can't just be established. You got to be established in something. So let's set this at the beginning. We're not just talking about you being established. We're talking about you being established in faith. Established in the word established in Jesus, established in righteousness, established in holiness. You cannot be established unless you know what you are established in. Established in the faith as you have been taught. So your establishing in the faith is dependent on how much faith you've been taught. It doesn't just happen overnight. A lot of times we want it to happen that way. We want the feeling to come before the believing comes. And your feelings are terrible guides. Your feelings are terrible guides. While we're talking about movies, I'm going to prove it to you. And I've said this before. So if you uh, have heard me say it before, just listen. All right. I'm, I've said this before. If um, how many of you uh, have watched a movie before and in the movie you cried, you cried during the movie. Now, at this time, most of the time, guys don't raise their hand. Like my man right here, he ain't raising his hand. He's just like. <laughs> you don't want to admit it. Raise your hand high. Be proud. How many of you have cried in a movie? Be proud. All right. All right. Put your hand down. How many of you cried because an animal died? How many of you cried because the main character died? How many of you cried because a character died? How many of you cried at the previews? Stop it. All right. How many of you, how many of you cried because, uh, because uh, two people uh, were supposed to get together, but they didn't get together? Yes. All of you Hallmark watching. <laughs> All right. Let me, I want to break it to you. I want to break it to you. The people that you wanted to get together when you cried in that movie, the people that you wanted to get together, they barely knew each other. The animal that you thought died didn't really die. He went home, ate some kibbles and bits. His owner got a paycheck. Right. Right. The, the character that you think died it, uh, is probably still alive unless they died in real life. Otherwise, they went and got in their limousine and they went home. Right. So what does that tell you? It tells you that the event that you saw depicted on the screen made you feel some kind of way, even though it lied to you. Oh, room got quiet. So you cried. Listen to this. You cried over a lie. So your feelings was a response to something that didn't exist. But it didn't matter. You still felt that way, even though the thing that you were feeling about was wrong, a lie. 
So how trustworthy are your feelings if they will respond to something that doesn't even exist? Yet, I don't feel right, then it must not be right. I don't feel good, then I must not be good. I feel bad, so I must be bad. That's how I feel about him. I must supposed to be with him. That's how I feel about her, so I'm supposed to be with her. I feel like she my wife. I feel like that's my husband. I don't like him. He don't make me feel right. <laughs> we walking around the most filious people with feelings that lie. I just felt, I felt like they were talking about me. They weren't talking about you. They was hungry. We can't trust our feelings. If you are established in your feelings, then you are going to be responding to a lie. If you're established in your emotions, you are going to respond to a lie. Now, here's the thing. The Bible never tells you not to feel. And a lot of people think that when we preach faith, we tell you that you cannot feel. That is not true. Let's get this thing right. okay? all right. We're going to get this thing right. They're going. Let's real talk this thing. Somebody say real talk. Let's real talk this thing. Let's get it right. Okay. Your feelings are 100 percent valid. They're just not 100 percent true. So how you feel is valid. If you feel sad, that's valid. You are sad in that moment. But you may not have any reason to be sad. If you are angry in that moment, that's a valid feeling. It's coming like you. It's real. Like you feel it. Right. But you may not have a reason to be angry. What solves the issue? What helps you? What's the answer? Somebody say answer. Yes. The answer is knowing the truth so that your feelings don't get out in front of you. The answer is knowing the truth. So that your feelings don't get out in front of you. That's the whole point of being established. Being established means I don't have to go chase the truth. The truth is already revealed to me in my heart and I've already made up my mind. So when the lie comes, I don't have to react to the lie because the truth has already been settled. Right. So when when I feel a certain way, I can I can answer my feelings with the truth. Y'all got it? All right, let's keep reading the scripture the same way. He says, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Abounding in what? Abounding in faith that you've been taught. So let's talk about what these things mean. Establish. The word established from the Webster's 1828. I like Webster's 1828 dictionary because Webster is a preacher. And he uses scripture to define his words. Establish 1828 dictionary means to set and fix firmly and unalterably to set permanently in the King James version of this scripture in the Bible. It doesn't actually say the word established. It says established S-T-A-B, not no E, no E. And if you look that up in the Greek, it means to make sure to fulfill or to prove that something is true. To prove that something is true. To prove that something is true. So for every person who told me that you cried at a movie, that doesn't make you bad or wrong. But if every person who told me you cried at a movie, if we prove that that person is still alive. If we can prove to you that that dog still exists, if we can prove to you that those things didn't really happen, then What you have said by definition is your feelings can never be your uh, indicator of whether or not you are established. You cannot use your feelings to indicate whether or not you are established. Doesn't matter how you feel about what I'm saying. Proving whether or not something is true has to come from something more concrete than how you feel about it. This word established in the Webster's 1828 dictionary has a little bit of a different. It means all the other things. But one of the things that it means is to set something into motion for the purpose of performance. So being established isn't necessarily about just what you believe. It's about what you do because you believe it. 
It's not necessarily about what you believe. It's about what you do because you believe it. The Bible says this. I won't. Well, we got lots of scripture, but I want to just tell you this because the Lord prompted me in my in, in my spirit. The Bible says this. The Bible says it when talking about faith. Without works being dead, the Bible says you say you believe and you do good. It's good for you to say that you believe. And the Bible says, but even the demons believe. And they tremble. Because of their belief. What sets you apart from the demons who believe you believe and the demons believe? It seems like y'all would be equal, right? Wrong. What sets you apart from the demons that believe? The demons tremble in fear because they know that they don't respond to God based on who they know him to be. You, as a child of God, respond to God based on who you know him to be. So as a father, I would much rather my child respond to me based on the fact that I'm their father over the fact that I just can beat them. I don't beat them, not that much. <laughs> Samuel's like, I beg, to, I beg to differ, right? It's, there's a difference between you and someone who just believes. There are a lot of people who believe that God is real. There are a lot of people who believe that Jesus uh, was a man and, and was real. There are a lot of people who believe and say that they believe that Jesus died on the cross and was raised from the dead, but they don't act like it. The difference is believing and acting is better than believing and not doing anything about it. One is established. The other the other one isn't. Why? Because performance matches what they say they believe. You will have to be. Listen to me, young person. You will have to be a doer and not a hearer only. If you are not a doer of what the word says, then you are fake. You make yourself out to be fake. Now, we have all done things that the word did not say. We've all done things that were outside of the realm of the word of God. Anybody in here ever sinned? Raise your hand if you've ever committed a sin. If you ain't got your hand up, we got to have a conversation. We're going to have an altar call just for you. Everybody else is eating dinner. You're going to spend your time repenting. (laughs) If you've ever done anything wrong, then you know what I'm talking about. I'm not saying you can't make a mistake and you can't do anything wrong. What I am saying is the moment you hear the word of God and the word of God challenges you on any level, your answer is to choose the word of God. I'm so glad Pastor Holden and I didn't talk about what he was preaching before he preached or before I preached. I'm so glad he taught what he taught because the integrity of the word of God and the validity of the word of God means this. If you say that you believe what the Bible says, it doesn't matter how you feel about it later you've already decided what you're going to do because you believe the word right right 1440 are you with me right right so is murder wrong is murder wrong is murder wrong okay does God is God the author of life is God the giver of life is God all about life That means that you've already said, and you know that from the Bible? You know that from the Bible? Then you've told me how you're going to vote for the rest of your life. I'm not talking about a candidate or a name. What you just told me is you will never, you will never vote for a candidate that supports abortion. That's what you just told me. Now, I'm, I'm not talking. We didn't we didn't I didn't couch it in politics just a second ago, because the moment I start talking about it being political, everybody's got a feeling. Right. That's the problem. The issue is not the issue. The issue is the feeling. 
Everybody feels some kind of way about it. I didn't ask you how you felt about the political issue of abortion. I asked you whether or not God is the author of life. I didn't ask you how you felt about the political issue of abortion. I asked you whether or not God is the giver of life. I didn't ask you how you felt about abortion. I asked you whether or not murder is wrong. According to the Bible. The word of God has to settle it. And there can be no debate after it. And this is a matter of life and death, not just about politics. This is a matter of life and death in your life. For the rest of your life. Why? Well, because if I'm going to live according to what God wants me, the way God wants me to live, and I'm going to trust him for the way God wants me to conduct my life, then I'm going to have to act like I'm a Christian. I'm going to have to respond to things as though I'm saved, which means some decisions I don't get to make anymore. I made the decision when I said Jesus is Lord of my life. Well, Pastor John, that's that's just condemnation. That's I thought we I want to be free. That I just want to be free. This is ultimate freedom. Why is this ultimate freedom? Because now you are free to live in the goodness of God and everything that he provides for you. You can't believe God for your money, but not believe God's word when he says that thou shalt not kill. Nothing changed. Thou shalt not kill. I was not in my notes either. So in order for you to live a life that is established and rooted, you need to know what established means. Established means fixed, unmovable. It's set for performance. It's not going anywhere. Now, I've been holding this before the Lord and the Lord's really been talking to me. um, And I believe that this is true. And so I say this by unction of the spirit. I believe that some of you are going to find and all of you, if you if you if you decide to take it, you're going to get answers this week. Answers to things that you've been holding before the Lord. And and why is that important? Because I believe that God is a God of answers and you were built to have an answer. This is the reason why you get so frustrated when there's no answer. Some of y'all are like, I don't get frustrated when there's no answer. Let me add, uh, well, let's, let's check it out then. How many of you uh, have a cell phone? Raise your hand. How many of you send text messages? Raise your hand. Now, I don't know what you Android people do. <laughs> I judge you immediately when your text message pops up green on my phone. All right? I don't know what y'all do. But us Apple people, we have the ability to see when someone has received our text messages. Right. It it says delivered. And you know that the text message has been what? Delivered. Delivered. Right. And then we have the ability to see when someone has read the text message. It says that the text message has been read. Read. Right. Let's say you send a text message to somebody. And you see delivered. And then you see read. And two hours passes. Three hours passes. A day passes. Two days goes by. Some of y'all done already thought about your boyfriend. You like, oh, no, he didn't. (laughs) Three days goes by. A week goes by. What did that person just do? They left you on. Which means that there was no response. There was no what? Answer. So there's something on the inside of you that doesn't like it when you don't have an answer. When you call somebody and they don't pick up the phone, you don't like not having answers. When you say something and nobody says anything back, you don't like not having answers. You know why you're like that? Because you were created in the image of God and the likeness of God and there's nothing that he can't answer. So on the inside of you, there's a hard wire to need a response to any issue or situation because your father has answers for everything. So you're like your father. You want the answer. 
So answers are important. And I believe in God for answers for you this week. But I want you to understand something. God is not holding an answer back from you. He will not withhold answers from you. In fact, he wants to answer everything for you. However, what you got to realize is that answers are not hidden from you. They're hidden for you. They're not hidden from you. They're hidden for you. For you how? You got to use your faith in order to ascertain answers. Some answers you can't get right now because you're not spiritually mature enough. Some answers you can't get right now because it's not time. But God wants you to have the answer. There's a hunger on the inside of you for answers. And I believe that God is going to move in the area of answers. So what's the definition of an answer? An answer means is a reply. It means to speak by way of return to fulfill or to perform something that was intended to perform it or to accomplish something. In other words, when you are when you are established in the word of God, you always have an answer for the things that challenge your faith. Why? Because you are established in faith. That's what the scripture just said a minute ago, right? Scripture just said you are established in faith. That means that there's always an answer for the things that challenge your faith. You know why? Well, I told you earlier, God uh, is a God of answers. He he uh, made you in his image and in his likeness. In the beginning, Genesis says in the beginning, God uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and void. Darkness was over the face of the deep. And God said let there be light, right? Y'all heard that scripture before? That word for said in Hebrew can also be translated answer. So in other words, the scripture would read this way. In the beginning, God created heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep and God answered the darkness with light. His answer to darkness was light. Pastor Holden showed you earlier the protein that holds all life together. It looks like a cross. Did you notice anything else about that protein picture? You know, who said it? Somebody said it. Who said it? Did y'all notice anything else about it? It had circles. What else? Yeah. Like it had like two swirling sticks around it. Yeah. It was kind of like the snake. It was. It was a circle. It had swirlies. Yeah. Anything else? You're right, Boaz. You're not wrong. Yes. It was glowing. That's not a coincidence. That's not just to make it look nice. The Bible indicates, Jewish scholars indicate, and even medical scholars indicates that light is the basis for all life. So God, when he created the universe, didn't just answer darkness. He spoke life into what was dead. So his answer is always life. His answer is always light. God has an answer for every situation. This definition for answer means reply, which means God has an opinion about everything in your life, who your friends are, uh, where you go, who you hang out with, how long you stay, whether or not you can be their friend. God always has an answer. It requires faith, though, for you to get that answer. A lot of times we go without answers, not because they don't exist, because we don't use our time to look in the word of God and apply faith to the word of God to get the answer. So let's look at this. Let's first of all, first and foremost, let's take let's uh, look at faith. What is faith? Anybody know what faith is? What is faith? Yeah. Glory to God. Hebrews 11, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I need an usher. I'm kidding. I don't need an usher. Don't run over here. I saw you, Jonathan. I was excited about her answer. Substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That is 100% true. What else is faith? What else? Yeah. Trust. It's a good word. What else? Yeah. What is it? Believe. Believe. That's good. What else? Boaz? I was going to say believe. You were going to say believe, but she got you to beat you. Yes. 
a confidence. I love that. A confidence. That's a good word. A confidence. So faith is not nebulous. It's not blind. It's not just out there. It doesn't it's not empty of meaning. It's not some kind of concept that people just came up with that there's no substance to. In fact, what she just told me, what Gianna told me is that faith by definition is evidence and substance. So we can figure out faith. We can dissect faith. We can know what faith is. My pastor, Pastor Terry, says it this way. In these last days, it's going to be almost impossible for you to live without knowing uh, what faith is, who has it and how to use it. Why? Because the world would tell you that faith is irrelevant. No more so than the world would tell you that it's OK for you to follow your feelings. On the surface, that sounds really good. But when you start digging into the statement, what you find is that there's death and darkness laced in the statement. Follow how you feel. If you drove however you feel. Some of y'all like I do drive how I feel. <laughs> I hope you got ticket money. If you drove however you feel. Let's say you ate however you feel. Anybody here an athlete? You're an athlete? Can you eat however you feel? No. 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 You're, you're going to play like trash, right? You can't do that. So you can't follow your feelings. So let's look at faith. Let's figure out what faith is. First John chapter five. Open your Bible. Y'all got Bibles, right? Just open them up. First John chapter five. I'm going to start at verse one. I'm going to wait and let you turn. And in order to wait and let you turn, I'll turn. First John chapter five. Starting verse one it says, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God and everyone who loves him who begat also loves him who is begotten of him, which means just simply this. If you love the father, then you love the son that came from the father. Verse two. By this, we know that we love that we love the children. Hang on. By this, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God or this is loving God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. So what have we learned so far? In order for you to be a Christian, you have to operate in faith. Verse one says, whoever is born of God, that's you. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. So your believing makes you born of God. Or in other words, your faith makes you born of God. And it says that everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. So if you love the father, you also love the son. By this, we know that we are the children of God when we keep when we love uh, when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is loving God or this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome for whatever is born of God. This is the good part. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the son of God. So we learned a couple of things about faith. If you're taking notes, the first thing we learned about faith here is you cannot be born again without faith. Which also answers another question, then who has faith? The born again believer. Born again believers have faith. Now, how many of you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? There's no condemnation in this question. I just want you to go ahead and raise your hand. If you've accepted Jesus, put it up there high. If you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, don't just raise it like this. Girl, you y'all better show some sign. All right. All right. Praise God. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you have the faith of God living on the inside of you. Say, I have the faith of God. I have the faith of God. 
Now, the problem with that sometimes is that we don't want to admit we have the faith of God because that makes us responsible. That makes us responsible, which means that you have the ability to use your faith. The question is whether or not you're going to use it. Right. The born again believer has faith and the born again believer has the ability to use their faith. You have the right to use your faith, not just the ability, but you have every right to use your faith for what the word of God tells you that you can believe for. You can find it in the word. You can use your faith for it. Also, using your faith will cause you to overcome regardless of the challenge. That's what he just said. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. You are a world overcomer. The only question is whether or not you are overcoming. You can overcome everything that happens in your high school. The only question is, are you? You can overcome everything that happens in your middle school. The only question is, are you? You can overcome boredom, distraction. The only question is, are you? You can overcome, I got to go to the bathroom every time somebody preaches the word of God. The only question is, do you? You are a world overcomer. I like this scripture so much that I named my favorite dog after this scripture. My dog's name is Nike. Now, some of y'all are like, you named him because you like Nike as your shoe. No, in Greek, this word for overcome is the Greek word Nike, which means to overcome. Nike is a 125 pound Rottweiler. If you come into my yard unannounced, you're going to find out what overcoming power looks like. <laughs> I guarantee you, you cannot outrun Nike. I don't care how much of an athlete you are. You can try, but you won't outrun him. This is overcoming power. And it's because of the faith that is in you. It's the same faith that you use to become a born again believer. You have the ability to overcome. Now, Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11, starting at verse 22. Now, in the morning, as they passed by, they saw a fig tree dried up from the roots. Where was it dried up from? Not the top, but the roots. Remember that. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you curse is withered up. So Jesus answered. Jesus did what? Answer. Jesus had an answer. Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. So in other words, Jesus answered and said, faith is the answer. The cross reference there is have the God kind of faith. In other words, the God kind of faith is the answer to everything that you're bewildered about. Peter sees this tree and Jesus, you curse this tree and it's died up from the roots. I don't know how that happened, but look at it. Check it out. It's dead. And Jesus didn't even check up on the tree. He said, listen, have faith in God. When I said the thing was going to die, it's going to die. You didn't believe it. You wanted to see it first. Have the God kind of faith. Now watch this. Jesus said, have the God kind of faith. And he says, for it's, uh, surely I say to you that he who says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes those things that he says will be done. He will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him that your father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. So what did we just learn about faith? Keep if you're taking notes, write these things down. Faith is authored by God. It is the God kind of faith. 
In fact, somebody quoted Hebrews 11 earlier to tell us what faith is. It's the, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 12 says that Jesus is the author and finisher, or in other words, perfecter of our faith. So the faith that we're talking about does not have its genesis with you. It didn't start with you. It didn't come from you. It was created by who? Okay, y'all say it like you mean it. Created by? God. So if it's God's faith, in you and you have the ability to use God's faith, then it's God's power that causes you to overcome. The God kind of power. What is your biggest problem? Just this is individual. What is your biggest problem? Now ask yourself this question. Can God solve it? If God can solve it, guess what else? You can solve it. Because the God kind of faith is living on the inside of you. What else we learn about faith? The primary way we use faith is with your mouth. The Bible says that he said, if you would say to this mountain and you believe what you say and don't doubt in your heart what you have said, you will have what you say. He uses say over and over and over and over and over again. So maybe just maybe the reason you can't pass that algebra class is because you keep saying, I don't understand. Maybe just maybe you feel so lonely because you keep saying, I don't have any friends. I found that interesting. I don't got any friends. I don't got any friends. I don't got any friends. What about that one person at church? Well, that's just one friend. I ain't got no other ones. So that one don't, don't count. You don't need but one good one. Why y'all want 20? That's too much to manage. Maybe what you are saying is keeping you stuck. Because the primary way that faith is released is by what you say. What else we learn? Well, we learn that faith is a force. Somebody say, use the force. Use the force. Faith is a force. How do we know faith is a force? What did he just say? If you say, you could say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea. Anybody in here ever been to the mountains? Y'all been to the mountains? Have you ever seen a mountain? Does that mountain look like it's ready to obey you if you say something? No, that mountain is looking at you like, whatever. Been here since the creation of all time. Be here when you're dead, right? The mountain doesn't look like it'll respond to you. But the word of God says you have the ability to move that mountain. What is that going to take? Tremendous force. This is so true that when God said, let there be light, the force that was released in those words changed all molecular structure so that light existed where there had been no light. And Pastor Holden said it at the beginning of his message. He said, while I've been here talking, the universe is steadily expanding. And he gave some kind of number and I'm willing to debate him on that number. It, it, that's wrong. It's much more than what he said. Why? Because light does not stop. Light is a force. Everything that God said, let there be, there was a force that went out of him to create it. So now that same force is yours to use when you speak the word of God. So you wonder why you're getting what you say. It's because you were created to release the force of God in everything you say. What else do we learn about faith? Faith will not work in an unforgiving heart. You need to write that down, circle it, star it, put some underliner on it, underneath it, highlight it, whatever it is you do to draw your attention to it. If you don't forgive, faith will stop. The word of God says faith works by love. So if you don't forgive, faith will stop. I said, if you don't forgive, faith will stop. Well, you don't know what they did to me. If you don't forgive, faith will stop. Well, you don't know what they said. If you don't forgive, 
faith will stop. Well, I don't, you know, this, it, the, the, the hurt, and the pain, the pain and the hurt may be true. But if you don't forgive, you will never get over it because your faith will not work in an unforgiving heart. Some people like to be hurt. Because you don't know how to be anything else. Y'all don't look at me like you mad at me. I mean, you might as well just say it's true. Some people enjoy being hurt and you know how you can't you don't tell by whether or not they answer you and say, I like being hurt. Nobody's going to say that. But when there's a, a way to get over it, we enjoy being in it so much that we don't take the way out. You get so used to it. What we just learned is that faith won't work in an unforgiving heart, which means the opposite is true. Faith will work if you have forgiveness in your heart. So if you really want to get over it, you're going to have to forgive. All right, we'll keep going. Faith in the word of God answers every challenge. Every challenge. Say every challenge. Every challenge. There are no answers outside of answers found in faith. However, when answers are found in faith, there are answers inside of the answer. Now, y'all looking at me like, what? The enigma in the, you talk, sound like Yoda. Listen, <laughs> words are carriers. Words are like buckets. In fact, anybody got a water bottle? Can I have that? Can I borrow your bottle? All right. So. Ice. OK. Praise God. Cold water. It's Texas, y'all. All right. So this is uh, what? A water bottle, right? Let's say this. Let's say this water bottle was empty. Right. And I gave it to you and I said, this is a water bottle. What could you put in here? You give it water. What else? Tea, Coke, motor oil, right? Because it's a bottle. It's a water bottle. Listen, watch this. It's intended to hold what? Water. But it will hold whatever you put in it. Right? I need to talk to you after service. <laughs> this man said hydrochloric acid. <laughs> That's how news, that's how news headlines start. That ain't, that ain't right. right. So this bottle will hold whatever you put in it. Doesn't matter whether or not you call it a water bottle. It'll hold whatever you put in it, right? Now, if I told you that this is a bottle of water. It's a bottle of water. Then what could you put in it? Nothing. Why? Because it's already full of water. Water. Huh. Words are containers. And if you just use words and put whatever you want in them, then they can be whatever it is you want them to be. I can say no to you in three different ways and make you feel some kind of way. I can say, what is that? Anyway, I can say, <laughs> seriously, I can say no. I can say um, no, I could say no. <laughs> I did it to her because I know she's going to be all right. Um, and it depends on what's in the word. Here's the other thing that we know about being full of something and not full of something. You were intended to be a glory carrier. But if there's no glory in you and you're empty, then the devil can fill you up with anything he wants. Because there's plenty of room to put whatever he wants in there. So let's look at this faith and answers. Jesus. At the beginning of his ministry, something significant happens. Jesus is baptized. All four gospel writers record the baptism of Jesus. All four. Um, Matthew chapter three. We're going to go through this quick. 
Matthew chapter 3, starting verse 13 says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized. And John tried to prevent him saying, I need to be baptized by you and you're coming to baptize me. But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so, for thus is fitting for the fulfillment of righteousness or the fulfill to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water and behold, the heavens were opened to him and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Uh, Mark's account. Same thing. Baptism. Uh, verse 11 uh, of chapter one, verse 11 says, and there came a voice from heaven saying, thou art my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Luke's account in Luke chapter three, uh, verse 22. Uh, and the Holy Spirit descending in bodily form like a dove upon him and a voice came from heaven and said, you are my beloved son in you. I am well pleased. John's account, John uh, chapter one, verses 29 through 34. We won't go through all the voice, all the uh, all the verses, but starting at verse 33 says, I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, upon whom you see the spirit descending and remaining on him. This is he who baptized with the Holy Spirit. And I have testified that this is the son of God. So do you see a pattern here. Jesus is baptized and God says, this is my, my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. He talks directly to Jesus and says, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Even John writes that I can testify to you that this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So Jesus gets a word from God. Let me tell you something, young person, at the end of this week, when this is all said and done, you're going to have a word from God, and then you're going to go home and Satan is going to challenge that word. If you don't spend the rest of this week becoming established, not just hearing the word, but a doer of the word, prioritizing the word, shaking off the sleepy, shaking off the distraction, shaking off the mess, and truly diving into the word of God, you're going to have a hard time holding on to that word. The rest of the story goes this way. Jesus is baptized. Here's you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And immediately Satan comes at the most vulnerable time. The Bible says as soon as he was baptized, he hears that word. The spirit of God leads him into the desert and he goes 40 days without food. How many of y'all can't go three hours without something to eat? I knew you'd raise your hand. I know y'all's out there. All you hungry people of which I am a part of the group. <laughs> right. So we know what it's like to be hungry, but you don't know what it's like to be this kind of hungry. Not unless you fasted 40 days. Fasting 40 days and the Bible says he was hungry. Y'all want to know um, uh, a little bit of insider information into this part of the Bible? Um, medical science says that if you fast for 24 to 48 hours, you will get hungry. But eventually your body will get to a place, a rhythm to where you're no longer hungry. Anybody ever in here ever gone without food so long you get past hungry? Has anybody done that? Like you're hungry, you're hungry, you're hungry. And then all of a sudden, you know, you haven't eaten, but you're no longer hungry. What your body has done is gone into survival mode. So your body says there must not be anything to eat. We better conserve everything we got. And we don't want this person eating anything all jacked up. So we are going to go into a survival mode. We're just going to live off of what's already there. But the, the medical science teaches us that after you fast it so long, that when you fast that long, hunger comes back. And when it comes back, it comes back with a vengeance. <laughs> like, I'm not just talking about hangry. I'm talking about I will eat anything. And the Bible says that Jesus had fasted 40 days. And so his body had become hungry again. It says afterward he was hungry. So his body had become hungry again. And medical science says when you become hungry like that, you are on the verge of your body beginning to shut down so much so that you must have food. 
This is how sinister the devil is. He waited to the most vulnerable time to attack Jesus when Jesus was hungry and said, if this is not just me uh, quoting scripture, Matthew chapter four, verses three and four says this. And when the tempter came to him, he said, if thou be the son of God. What did Jesus just hear when he was baptized? You are my son. In whom I'm well pleased. And as soon as he was away by himself and had gone without food and was weak and in a state of weakness, the devil comes and says, <laughs> you're not really the son of God. Now, you may say that's not what the word says. You're embellishing. Well, wait a minute before you accuse me of adding stuff to the word. Notice what the scripture called him. What did scripture, the scripture call it? It didn't say Satan. What did he call him? The tempter. The tempter. One of the things, one of my favorite things um, that that it's not a temptation unless you want to. It's not a temptation unless you want to. I'm not tempted to eat jalapenos because I don't like jalapenos. I know some of y'all are real upset with me right now. Leave me alone. I don't like jalapenos. There's no temptation for me to eat jalapenos. Now, Captain Crunch. That's a whole day. I'm talking about mixing bowl and the big spoon. Temptation. It's only a temptation if you want to. So here's the deal. The Bible says the tempter came, which means Satan made it look real good. Satan said, you're not really the son of God. There's no way you, you can't be this. If you I tell you what, prove it. If you're the son of God, turn these stones into bread. I know you're hungry. I know you're hungry. Turn them into bread. Prove to me that you are the son of God. And watch what the word of God says. But he answered. Jesus didn't just go by his feelings. He had an answer. It says, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. He didn't just answer him. He answered him in faith. How do I know that's true? Well, the Bible says that he didn't just give him how he felt about the situation. He answered him with the word of God. He said, it is written. Somebody open your Bible to Deuteronomy chapter eight. Not I don't need everybody, but when you once somebody has it open to Deuteronomy chapter eight, run up here. Oh, Ashley is rolling. All right. All right. I got two of you. Look at how she looked at him, too. She, she ran up here and looked at him like this. <laughs> like, how dare you take my moment? All right. I'll take both of you. Deuteronomy 8. You open yours to Deuteronomy 6. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. Read it. Verse 3. I'll stand next to you so the microphone can pick you up. Come on, girl, you ran up here and hey, everything. I, went, and... I ran, I ran, that's what happened. All right, you, you at the right place. It won't even turn. Do the wrong check. Come on, you got, oh, you got one of them grandmama Bibles. <laughs> you got one of them Bibles that your grandmama had on her back porch. Anyway, all right, go, go, eight, three. And he humbled thee and... Hey, you got a microphone? Go ahead, read it. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. So Pastor Holden just taught you something about the timeline of the Bible. Jesus, when he was tempted, answered Satan with a scripture that was thousands of years old. So this wasn't how he felt. This was an answer from the word of God. I'm believing God's going to give you answers. Whether or not you feel like you have the answer is irrelevant. You're going to have to answer it with the word of the living God. I'm here to tell you that regardless of how you feel about you. God has something to say about you. He has an answer. 
regardless of how you feel about what you can do or who you are attracted to. God has an opinion and it's in the word. He has an answer. Let's keep going. So it says that uh, uh, Matthew, same chapter, verse five. Then the devil took him up to the holy city and set him on a pinnacle and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written. He shall give his angels charge over you and in their hands they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against the stone. He quotes scripture to him. That's Psalm 91. Jesus said to him, here's another answer. It is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Deuteronomy chapter six, verses 16 and 17. 16. Do not test the Lord your God as you did at Massah. Massah. Be sure to keep the commands of the Lord your God and the stipulations and decrees he has given you. So don't test or tempt the Lord your God, which means that Satan gave him an answer to his answer that was in scripture, but the scripture that Satan gave him didn't apply to the word or didn't apply to the situation. In other words, you're going to have to know the word of God so much that you're not just led by somebody who sounds good. Amen. Amen. And, and thank y'all. Y'all can go have a seat. Thank y'all. Y'all give them a hand. I'm going to say this in the spirit of this, in the spirit of this real talk moment. Listen to me. Look at me. Look at me. and Listen to me. In the spirit of this real talk moment, because this is a teenager meeting, this is not a children's meeting. Y'all ain't in super kids no more. Nothing wrong with super kids, but sometimes you got to grow up. In the spirit of growing up, let me just say this. Satan in that second temptation answered Jesus or tempted Jesus and he even used scripture. Everything that sounds good is not good. So people will tell you it's okay for you to love whoever you want to love. Because it's love, right? Wrong. That is not what the word of God says. And how dare someone who doesn't live for God tell you how to live for God? But, but, but you, you're supposed to be nice. You're a Christian. Stop it. Show me the nice scripture. Turn to the scripture that says uh, you're supposed to be nice. That's 5th John chapter 2. No, it don't exist. What does scripture say? The scripture says I'm supposed to love you. And if I love you, I'm going to be honest with you. And being honest with you means no, love is not just love. Love is of God. Love is a person. Love is, a, is an individual. Love gave his son for you. Love made the ultimate sacrifice for you. Love laid down his life for you. You don't get to define what love is. Amen. The Bible says God is love, not how you feel. Your feelings don't get to define what love is. Only God can do that. And he has defined it by himself. He says, I, I am love. Third temptation. Says this, then the devil took him into the holy city on the pinnacle. Oh, I'm sorry. Again, the devil took him. This is Matthew 4, verse, sorry, verse 8. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory and said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, answering him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Every time, every time Satan tempted God, it was not a feeling that answered the devil. It was the word of God. Jesus didn't go. I was in worship this morning. So Satan, you must be a liar. 
Jesus didn't go, man, that's my favorite worship song and that's got a rhythm to it. Jesus did not put his iPods in or iPod, iPod did I say iPod, AirPods? That tells you how old I am. <laughs> did not put his AirPods in and start listening to Maverick City. Because that won't make the devil go away. There's nothing wrong with good worship. I'm not dogging worship. I promise you, I'm not telling you that worship does not have a place and that you don't need to worship. In fact, the Bible says that when Saul was plagued by demons, David came and ministered in song and the demons left him. But the problem is when we quote that scripture, we forget Saul was disqualified to stand in the place of king because his heart wasn't right before the Lord. Another way of saying that is his heart was not established. So he needed something momentary to get the devil off of him. Wow. Saul couldn't fight his own devil. So a man after God's own heart had to come minister to him. You're not Saul. Amen. The word of God is the only thing that will establish you. The word of God is the only thing that will bring answers. Because you don't have time to play around. You don't have time. Listen, um, people oftentimes say you can't talk to teenagers about politics because they don't care. You better care because they're not coming for me. I'm 45 years old and a conservative. They ain't going to change my mind. You change my mind. Are you kidding? I got five kids. Three dogs, a house. I'm setting my ways. But you know whose mind they will change? His. It's my son. His. They'll tell him stuff like, well, that was your daddy's religion. That's not your, you just believe that because your daddy said that. They'll tell him stuff like, no, it's OK, because everybody should have the, the ability to make their own choice. Right. So we better tell you about it, because if we don't talk to you about it, you'll be swayed. That's the issue. And, and I, not only that, but you should be angry at the assertion that you are not smart enough to understand political things. If I were you, I'd be angry every time somebody said, well, don't talk about politics because that doesn't apply to teenagers. I would be mad because what they're saying is you are too dense to sit and listen to real issues. Just go play a video game, baby. Go post something on TikTok. Let the adults handle this. That should make you angry. It should make it. It should it should be all the more fuel for you to get serious about the things of God. Why? Because you need answers. You need you live in a world right now that's constantly lying to you. If you're a female or a male in here, it doesn't even matter if you're a female or a male. The social media is constantly telling you if you don't look like what you see on social media, you're worthless. Y'all stop me when I'm lying. Everybody posting their highlight reel from their vacation and your every day is supposed to look like their Hawaii trip. You're going to have to be established in the word of God in order for you to live as a teenager. You need answers. You need answers. So how do you get answers? Let me start closing this up. Number one, write these down. This is how you get answers. Number one, watch your mouth. Watch your mouth. Anybody ever told you to watch your mouth? Anybody? Most of the time when somebody says watch your mouth, that, that's like a precursor for a fight. Right. Like that. Uh, either that or somebody you can't fight. <laughs> it's like yeah, My mama said, watch your mouth. Don't fight your mama. No, do, do not go back to your room going. Pastor John said I should fight you. <laughs> You're wrong. Watch your mouth. Number one, this is not as simple as it sounds. It requires strategic training. I'm a, um, I like war movies and I really like Navy SEALs. I think Navy SEALs are like the best 
most awesome fighting force in the whole world. And one of the things that happens when you become a SEAL is you go to special training of how to survive torture. Satan is a master torturer. He will torture you. And you know what the what the most effective type of torture is? It's not torture that that you think it's the kind of torture that inflicts pain that, that you can't even explain, like not just in your flesh, but in your mind. Satan will torture you to get you to say something that the word of God doesn't say. He's a master torturer. So you're going to have to watch your mouth and you're going to have to be strategic about it. In, in other words, you can't just say, oh, yeah, there you're right. I don't need to say the wrong things. Oh, no, you're going to have to literally watch what you say to the degree that you are strategic about every word that comes out of your mouth. Listen to the scripture. Hebrews 10, 23 says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. Now, that scripture may not sound like much, but when you dig into it, it's some Navy SEAL kind of stuff. The word hold fast is two, uh, a compound Greek word that when you put them together, it literally means to hold something down and suppress it so that it does not move. In other words, it, it's the picture of locking someone to the floor, pinning them to the floor and making sure that they can't move not one inch of their body. And that's how you're supposed to hold fast your confession. You're supposed to be that way with your words. In other words, it does not matter how I feel. I'm going to lock down my confession. I don't care if I'm mad. I don't care if I'm angry. I will not say hateful words to you. I will stay in love no matter what. If it costs me everything, I will not get out of my love walk. I don't care how I feel. I don't care if I feel depressed. I will never say that I'm depressed. I will never give over to that devil. And it doesn't mean that you just don't say it and you fake it. It means that you don't say it because you know it's a lie. You're going to have to watch your mouth. You will not get answers if you don't watch what you say. Number two. And I want you to put, uh, put quotations around this. What did I say? What did I say, I keep looking in this direction because all my children are sitting in this direction, but they hear me say this all the time. What did I say? No, what did I, what did I say? Well, uh, I, I, I didn't, did you, did you eat your lunch today? You packed your lunch this morning, right? Yeah, I packed my lunch this morning. Did you eat your lunch? Uh, no. Then what did you eat? I bought lunch at school. You supposed to eat your lunch, but I was hungry and I didn't like what they had. My response is, what did I say? What did I say? I know what you wanted to do, but what did I say? And this isn't something that's popular in today's, uh, in today's um, generation. I've watched y'all deal with y'all's parents. I have watched this happen. Um, if, if we talk to our parents, I need to testify. I need somebody that can testify. If we talk to our parents the way y'all talk to y'all's parents, some of y'all wouldn't exist Cause we wouldn't have made it. <laughs> My mama didn't have to explain the reason. She just said, what did I say? Now the issue is I'm not just on my soapbox. The issue here is this is a spiritual concept. Um, John chapter 12 verses 49 and 50. This is Jesus speaking. And Jesus says this, for I have not spoken on my own authority. But the father who sent me gave me a command what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the father has told me, so I speak. So Jesus himself said, I will not say anything unless the father said it. And even if I feel like saying something opposite, I'm only going to say what my father says. This spiritual concept doesn't exist a lot in this world or in this generation because this generation has lied to you and said you live your truth. 
Live how you live your truth. Whatever your truth is, you live your truth. Can't nobody tell you what to do. I'm here to tell you if you want answers, you're going to have to get over that. In fact, that scripture I just read you a second ago from Hebrews chapter 10 that says that you're to hold fast your confession without wavering. The word confession there, profession or confession, is a Greek word that literally means to say what has already been said. In other words, you're supposed to not say what you feel. You're supposed to say what he has already said. The answer has already been given you. You're supposed to just repeat the answer that has been given to you. The word of God says something about you. The word of God has called you fearfully and wonderfully made. If you look in the mirror and you don't like what you see, you are not supposed to confess how you feel about what you see. You're supposed to confess. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. If you have friends, the word of God says, don't be unevenly yoked with unbelievers. For what relation does light have with darkness? If you have friends that are unbelievers, stop lying to yourself that they're going to become believers because you are their buddy. Man, I love it when it gets good and quiet. That doesn't mean you can't be friendly, but that can't be your best friend. That can't be your best friend. If you're dating somebody that's not a believer, you need to break up with them. Just being real with you. Why? Because you can't be unevenly yoked with unbelievers and you keep telling yourself, I'm going to minister to them and they're going to see the love of God in me and they're going to change. Well, minister to them and get them saved, but stop wasting time trying to have something in common with someone who fundamentally disagrees with you. Glory to God. Not going to get many social media follows out of this. <laughs> you are going to have to ask yourself, what did God say about this? What's God's opinion about this? And it's not going to always be fun. It's not going to always be awesome. You're not going to always love it. You're not going to always uh, enjoy it, but it will always save your life and there will always be answers attached to it. Number three, last one, don't wobble. I'm not talking about the dance. Some of y'all are like, what's the dance? (laughs) Don't wobble, don't wobble. Scripture says in Romans that Abraham staggered not at the promises of God. That word stagger there is the same word for doubt. And the word doubt is the same word wobble. It literally means to waver back and forth and to wobble like something that's unstable. And it, back in the day, well, there used to be a toy called a weeble. And uh, the commercial said, weebles wobble, but they don't fall down. You don't get to be a weeble. You don't get to wobble. Don't wobble. What do I mean? James chapter one, starting verse six says, but let him ask in faith with no doubting for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind for let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from God. He is a double minded man, unstable in all his ways. When you wobble at the word of God, you stop your answers. You're going to have to accept what the word of God says. You're going to have to accept what the word of God says. In other words, you're going to have to respond. You're going to have to respond to the word as though the word of God is true. I just said something a little early and I I sense, you know, when you're preaching and the anointing is present, you can sense when there is a disconnect with people in the audience who don't believe what you just said. But just a moment ago, I was preaching along and I said that if you're dating an unbeliever, you're going to need to break up with them. And I sensed a serious disconnect. It was almost like you said, "Ah, how dare you? You don't understand. I love him. I love her. But the question is. Are you a believer? Do you love the situation more than you love God? 
Because the issue has everything to do with whether or not you're going to wobble at the things of God. Will you compromise your dating relationship, your friendship even? Will you compromise that for the word of God and being established in his word? You're going to have to respond. You're going to have to respond. And I'm going to show you the difference between failing to respond and responding. To close this, at the, at, and I told you, we did the altar call before, so I'm just going to dismiss as soon as uh, I'm done. Because I want this word to sit in your heart. But I want to illustrate this to you. If you listen to what I've said and you don't respond to it. Uh, Mwer, come here. Stand next to me. This is Moir. <laughs> Wave it, everybody, Moir. All right, this is Moir. Moir, I want you to get down on the floor. Like sit, sit. Yeah, just sit down on the floor. Crisscross applesauce. It hurts. Yeah, okay, that's okay. Close to crisscross applesauce. Now, turn toward me. When you hear the things of God preached, and you feel some kind of way and you respond out of your feeling and you go to an altar and you go, I, I, just pray for me, Pastor Catherine, pray for me, Pastor Holden, pray for me, Pastor Era. And you respond to the altar call. You go up to the altar call, right? But you're not a doer of the word. There's no corresponding response or action. This is what the altar call is like. Now, where I'm going to take your hand. And I want you to do nothing. Okay. Do nothing. All right. Don't, like, don't do nothing. Just just sit there. Do nothing. <laughs> this is what it's like with you at an altar. We're trying to pull you to a place and you're not responding. You're doing nothing. You're doing nothing. Now. Um, let me see. Come here. Yeah, you. I'm not going to say anything about size difference. I'm just going to say you see there's a difference, right? I want you to watch this, okay? The Bible says if you have faith the size of a, then you'd be able to do what? So you could do big things with faith that even if it's not developed faith, like we want to develop the faith, but if you just use the faith of God, you can do big things, right? Now watch this. Take Moir by his hand. All right, now um, I want you to lock hands with him like this. There you go. Like, no, no, what you were going to do, Moir, you were right. Okay? Now, Cristiano, listen to me. Okay? You're going to pull Moir up. <laughs> he just looked at me like this. He went... That is pastoral trust right there. <laughs> You're going to pull Mwer up, okay? Mwer, this time, I don't want you to do much. I just want you to respond. Respond to what he's doing. Because when you come to an altar, we don't ask you to fix you. We just ask you to respond as though the word of God you just heard was true. You're going to have to go home and respond. You're going to have to respond in your bedroom. You're going to have to respond in the locker room. You're going to have to respond at the, at the lunch table. You're going to have to respond when you're with your friends. You're going to have to respond when your friends are watching stuff that you ought not be watching. You're going to have to respond when they text you something that you know you ought not answer. You're going to have to respond when something's on social media that you know you ought not be looking at or something's on the internet that you know you ought not be looking at. You're going to have to respond. You're going to have to act like you are a Christian. Amen. You're going to have to respond. I don't want you to pull him. I, I want you to pull him up. You're going to help him up. I don't want you to try to hold his weight. I just want you to do your part on your part. And all I want you to do is respond to what he's doing. Just respond to him. Ready? One, two, three. Go. 
Respond to him. Pull, pull. Respond. That's all I need you to do. Listen. Here's the deal. If I were down here, Christiana, come here. Turn around. He could have pulled him down. Thank you for the kick. That was extra. <laughs> you would almost think I paid him to do that. He could have pulled him to the ground with the wrong response. And some of you are pulling yourselves down. It's not the devil. The devil doesn't even have to exert any power over you. You pull you down by not responding to what you know to be the truth. You're going to have to be established enough to just respond. Respond to God. I, I know I'm making it sound simple, but the word, the, 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 uh, the anchor scripture says, establish in faith just as you were taught. Just do what you've been taught. Just do what you've been taught. There's a temptation. The Bible says flee. He don't ask you to deal with the temptation or try to make it go away. Just run. Just run. Sometimes running is the most holy thing you can do. Trust me, I know. Just run. The Bible didn't ask you to solve the world's problems. Just act like you're a Christian. Just respond. Thank you, guys. Y'all give them a hand. Now, tonight, tonight, my good friend Dean Sykes will be here. I know y'all are excited. I'm excited about Dean. But I need, I need you to do something. I don't need you to come in here waiting on Dean to solve your problems. I'm a, he's, a, he's a really close friend of mine. And um, the anointing is on his life to, to minister to people um, where suicide is concerned, where rejection is concerned. A lot of life controlling issues. But I'm going to tell you something. And Dean would tell you the exact same thing. Dean Sykes is not the solver of those problems. The anointing on his life didn't come from him. It came from God. So tonight, I want you to change your thinking. You are not responding to Dean. You're responding to the anointing. All right. If, if I could do if we're going to do anything, we're going to raise up a generation of mature Christians where you stop chasing preachers. And start chasing the anointing that's on the man and woman of God. Amen. Amen. Right? right. That, that you are going to have to learn that it's the anointing that's on them. That it's one of our core values. We protect the anointing. I'm not belittling the man and woman of God. What I am saying is you focus on the anointing tonight. Amen. And I'm believing what comes off of you won't come back. Yeah. Amen. Amen? Amen. All right. Adults are out, so I can dismiss y'all. I'm standing real close to you. Let me back up. God loves you. We love you. And Jesus is Lord. Praise God. Raised on the front rows. It comes with its own uh, dangers. I got